would like to welcome you all f out for coming. Thank you for being here. And, and uh, um, I'm Doug Anderson. I'm an ear, nose, and throat uh, physician with the Ogden Clinic. I know many of you, some I don't. And, um, but I, I'm hopeful uh, that because of this workshop, you'll feel like uh, it was a collaborative learning effort, um, that we all uh, helped each other out with our uh, own insights and experience because I, I don't uh, proclaim to know everything. I, you know, I've, I've been in practice in Ogden about 25 years and, and, and seen and treated a lot of nosebleeds. And, uh, um, you know, I think everyone sort of finds things that work. Uh, um, one thing I have used is a, is a consensus statement put out by our academy on, on treatment of epistaxis. And, and is based on literature, it's graded on, it's evidence. And, and so I try to incorporate those in our lecture. And, but I do have as far as goals for our uh, lecture today, and, and I'm, I'm hoping you can all contribute. So if you need me to stop and you wanna ask questions, you can. As you know, I have some uh, little things that I've brought to show some samples of, of things I have in a little kit, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later. Uh, but the goals that I have for today are to understand the causes of epistaxis, have a knowledge of recommendations to help prevent nosebleeds that you can give to your patients, establish a treatment algorithm that in your mind, if you know what, what's the first thing I should try and, and go from there, um, and then understand situations that can make uh, treatment of uh, nosebleeds difficult. I'm sure all of you have had those situations where you just can't get the, the nose to stop bleeding or you can't put the pack in or something, something not working right. Um, and, uh, and then also uh, to be able to put together an epistaxis kit uh, that will help improve our successful treatment. Um, there was a physician and, and he had a famous quote, uh, his name was Chevalier Jackson and he was the father of bronchoscopy. And, uh, and he had a, a famous saying, he, he, uh, he's passed away now, but he would put on these courses every year at Temple University. And, and uh, I went to one of those courses after he had passed away, but they still were continuing on these courses. And, but uh, uh, his quote was is, uh, that uh, if you prepare for something that you're gonna do in your office, you don't know when it's gonna come in, but if you put in two minutes of preparation, your procedure could take two hours. But if you put in at least two hours of preparation, then the procedure you do will take about two minutes. And so I, I, and with that in mind, I think putting together an epistaxis kit is really helpful. And so we have like a little basket that we, we use in, in addition to things that we have in each of our rooms. And so uh, uh, anyway, uh, hopefully we'll talk about that here in a minute. And then uh, I want you to have increased knowledge of what to consider if, if you just can't get the nose to stop bleeding or if it just keeps recurring and they keep coming back, what are some other things that you can consider? So, uh, so just as far as prevalence, uh, about 60% of uh, people in the U.S. will have at least one nosebleed at some point in their life. And it also must be noted that 6% of these people will need to seek medical attention. In addition, I think it's interesting that almost a half a percent of all ER visits are due to nosebleeds. And uh, maybe some of you who work in the ER, or if you've worked in the ER, may find, you know, but this is according to the articles I read. And up to a third of all ENT uh, visits in the ER are, are secondary to nosebleeds. Um, and uh, uh, there is 70% uh, um, are sort of iatrogenic or, or trauma or from com comorbid mor morbid conditions or medications. Uh, there seems to be a bimodal age distribution uh, where a lot of the patients are either under the age of 10 or somewhere between 70 and, nine, and, 70 and 79 years of age. But certainly we, we see patients of all ages, but those are some common peak uh, age groups that we tend to see. And it's an equal uh, uh, incidence between males and female. And uh, certainly anatomical factors can play a risk, such as polyps or a deviated septum or maybe a tumor or telangiectasias or, uh, or some other issue or maybe infection going on. Um, there certainly is environmental issues too. Perhaps the patient has allergic rhinitis uh, or they live in a very dry state or they're on oxygen. Um, so those are some things to think about. We do know in the winter months our air tends to be uh, drier, um, and so we're more prone to nosebleeds. Um, 
some people have coagulopathies or inherited uh, conditions that make them prone to nosebleeds that we should be aware of. We all know about uh, the different medications that are out there. Some may affect the function of the platelets. Others affect the coagulation cascade, different factors in that cascade. And, and some take longer to, to reverse and others less time. So there's a lot of things to, to, uh, to consider. But certainly uh, many of our patients have comorbid conditions that make them prone to, to nosebleeds, such as uh, renal disease, and, and uh, which we know can uh, affect the coagulation cascade. Uh, uh, coagulation cascade and uh, uh, liver disease and uh, high blood pressure and certainly other other uh, issues. So what are some of the anatomical things that we may see that may make a person prone to nosebleeds? Uh, so this is a picture uh, commonly seen and so let's say someone comes into your office or clinic and they have a history of nosebleeds and you uh, so first of all I think it's very important that uh, that in your your armamentarium that you have a headlight uh, you, you you don't want to be trying to look in their nose and hold the headlight up but uh, it's a, sort of um, um, makes it difficult to treat if you saw something but this is a dilated vessel and in my experience if we were to say that this part of the nose is the anterior superior triangle or corner of the quadrangular cartilage and this is the posterior inferior right where it just sort of attaches right above the pre, um, uh, maxillary crest but in that area a lot of this, there are some vessels that sort of radiate in that area but that whole sort of anterior s uh, area of the nose is called Kieselbeck's plexus and a lot of vessels uh, are in that area but you can see this one's quite prominent and dilated and uh, and so sometimes uh, if you just were to gently rub that area with a Q-tip mo moistened with numbing medicine. Even if it's not bleeding now, you can not, not only numb it, but you may stir up a fragile vessel to start bleeding. And then you sort of know, that's it. If you rub it and nothing happens, maybe keep looking. These, these are some polyps. And notice the color uh, compared to like a turbinate down um, below. Uh, uh, if you see on the left side, uh, that's the color of a turbinate, more pinkish red. Uh, but polyps are, in general, more pale, although I have seen some sort of hemorrhagic colored polyps. Uh, certainly some people have from trauma or infection, certainly in pregnancy you can see this in pyogenic granulomas and it's sort of a purpley vascular thing. Often they almost fall off if you suction them. Um, but anyway, that's a pyogenic granuloma. This is a person who has hereditary hemorrhagic telangic tasias, and as you know, that can be a horrible thing. And uh, probably many of you have seen those patients, and they have the classic telangic tasias on their lips or on their skin, but they can have those same lesions in the nose. And these can be very, very difficult to, to treat, and sometimes you may see them, and they're walking around with a hemoglobin of 5 or 7 just because they're chronically having issues with bleeding. They can be quite scary. Uh, here's another patient with... Uh, this disorder and, and of course has these lesions on the lips, these telangic tasias. And then uh, if you have a teenager, a male, a 17 year old male that comes in as having recurrent heavy nosebleeds uh, and you can't see where they're coming from, you know, I think you have to consider is there something in the back of the nose? And so we know that juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibromas uh, can be seen in that age group and so you have to at least consider that. And here's a CT scan of that. Uh, uh, angiofibroma. And then septal perforations. M maybe many of you have patients who have holes in their septum, perhaps from nose picking or trauma or surgery or using uh, too many sprays or using cocaine. And, and it's common that they will have frequent recurrent nosebleeds along the, the margin of that hole. And, and, and it's a difficult thing to treat too because the more you cauterize that rim, the bigger that hole is going to get over time and, and perhaps make their symptoms of nasal issues worse, which could be congestion or sinusitis or uh, further bleeding and crusting. So what are some things that we can prevent? I know many of you already know this, so I'll go through this rather quickly. But if any of you think, oh, I do this or I recommend uh, another thing, you know, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, but certainly humidifiers, saline sprays or gels or uh, salves. You know, there's some salves out there that have sort of mineral uh, oils in them. A couple that are, that are common out there, one's called Alkalol, not alcohol, but Alkalol. And it just has some, it's sort of saline with some minerals, oils in them. And, and, and um, another is Poneris spray. And, and so those are some options you, could, you can get a hold of uh, and they can help. Um, 
and uh, uh, certainly AYR gel and saline gel and I'm not supposed to mention <laughs> any names, product names. I'll try not to if I, if I slip, forgive me, but I have no um, um, uh, commercial uh, endorsements. I, I, if I were to, um, I, I am on the uh, on a research thing for Inspire, and we enroll our patients in Inspire, and and we do get a, a, a stipend for that, but it has nothing to do with this lecture. So, um, anyway, so um, uh, the other things uh, that we can tell our patients is to avoid the excessive use of sprays. So some patients are on uh, different sprays for their allergies uh, that may that may you know fluticasone for example is one and there's others that have uh, fluticasone uh, plus a, a, a other medicines that help with with allergic rhinitis and so um, so those if they're sprayed inappropriately towards the septum can can cause irritation and crusting and and bleeding um, and certainly we we know that there's other medications people that are on on uh, um, diuretics uh, may dry them out or, or other medications certainly we need to caution them about uh, <laughs> Uh, avoiding picking their nose or uh, or that you know uh, we always were told that uh, if there were some that came in and said they never picked their nose they were a liar so uh, um, especially if they were male but uh, anyway so there's a lot, a lot of nose pickers out there unfortunately but so just caution them on that um, uh, so um, and so then to treat the underlying infections, if you see they have an infection or if they have allergies, you want to control those better. Um, and, uh, and you can treat anatomical abnormalities, whether it be polyps or granulomas or, or uh, other things like that. And then, uh, um, and then make sure uh, that they have humidification if they're on oxygen. So 95% of nosebleeds are coming from the anterior part of the nose, that Kiesel uh, box plexus, and which is supplied by both the external and the internal carotid artery, um, uh, specifically from the superior labial, the uh, sphenopalatine artery, and the greater palatine artery, uh, and then also the anterior ethmoidal artery. Um, so those are the, the vessels that sort of c uh, come together and form this plexus. 5% of, of nosebleeds are posterior, and they are generally uh, supplied by the sphenopalatine artery and the terminal branches of the internal maxillary artery. And so I would say, in my experience, most of the time, those posterior nosebleeds are coming from, from uh, adults in, uh, between 60 and 80 years of age, and, and usually there's, they, they can bleed out the front of their nose, but often they bleed out both sides heavily because it's at the back of the nose, so it can go either right or left, and a lot is going down the back of the throat. And, and the traditional, you may put in a pack, and if it's not far, far enough back, it's going to just keep bleeding down the back of their throat. And so that's, that's something to keep in mind. So here's a picture of the, the Kieselbeck's plexus in that uh, brownish circle there, and you can see the vessels that are feeding it that we talked about. And then, of course, the posterior uh, uh, portions of the sphenopalatine artery, um, uh, uh, just an anterior to the um, sphenoid sinus in the face of the sphenoid, um, is, is uh, uh, where posterior nosebleeds come from. And really, it comes from, and I'll show you later, the posterior middle meatus there. So what is the treatment algorithm? And so the treatment algorithm is that we, you know, that person, before they get in trouble, should obviously right away put pressure to the lower third of the nose and hold it firmly for five minutes. Um, it's amazing. A lot of people don't do that. You know, they, they'll, they'll put ice on or they'll lay down, or, but they, you know, they don't really just pack, uh, put pressure on their nose. And then obviously, if, they're, if, the, if that's not successful and you're worried about that they've lost lots of blood, you obviously need to check uh, vital signs and consider ABCs. Position again. If they're if they're just coming in with a bad nosebleed and their vital signs are good, uh, you want to keep them sitting up, not laying down, because otherwise it may may compromise their airway. It may go down the back of their throat. They may be swallowing it, and and that can cause some problems too. So keep them sitting up and leaning forward just a little bit and holding pressure on that lower third of the nose. And then obviously, uh, if you can, and some of this can be done at the same time, try to get a, a history. Um, uh, you know, are they on blood thinners? Is there, is there a family history of bleeding disorders? Um, and has there been recent trauma or recent surgery? Um, and so those are important. And then, and then if you're concerned about excessive blood loss, if in the history you say they've thrown up a sink full of blood, uh, then, you know, I'd get some labs and uh, apply some topical medications. And, uh, you know, uh, 
we, you know, we apply obviously afrin, but there's topical adrenaline. There's, uh, you can apply some numbing medicine at the same time, whether it be lidocaine or cocaine or, or to, uh, pontocaine uh, to numb it for any potential treatment. Uh, some people use tran, uh, tran acid, um, um, and that, uh, and that uh, uh, works well. There's been some studies that talk about that, and we'll talk about that. Certainly, cautery is uh, effective in many cases. Uh, uh, um, um, nasal packing is effective. And often, about 20% uh, of the time uh, that uh, uh, you've done that, you've also done cautery, too. And, uh, and then if you're concerned about the, the amount of blood or the age group, or maybe you saw something in the nose, uh, consider a CT scan. And then if things are not getting better, uh, then someone has to take a look further back on the nose uh, with a scope or something to see, is there a mass back there that you need to worry about? And, and then you start thinking about surgical, whether it be a biopsy or an endoscopic clipping of that sphenopalatine artery uh, or uh, interventional radiology. So this is uh, things that we use commonly. And, and, and so if you want with your phone, you can maybe take a picture of it. Um, and, uh, and this isn't like, this is just what I thought of. It's not like from a book or anything like that, but that you may think other things that work, but, but, but certainly a, a headlight is important, speculum, suction, uh, appropriate nasal instruments, uh, bayonet forceps, we say, um, are, are important, you know, topical medications, uh, Q-tips, cotton pledgets, and ones that we use... If I can reach here. So ones that we use are, these are um, just cotton pledgets. They're like little strips of compressed cotton with a little string on it so you don't lose. And uh, um, so you can look at that. And there's probably different brands. Um, so that's something. Again, these are the uh, bayonet forceps, the nasal speculum to expose, and then certainly different medications. And then there's a variety of different packs. Like I say, I, I don't have any... Um, uh, financial interest in any uh, nasal packing company and and so there, here's some different varieties so I would say though um, you may want to have a combination of some non-dissolvable packing for example Vaseline coated strip gauze uh, and uh, uh, or maybe a Maricel sponge uh, that, that it's not dissolvable, um, or a, a, a rapid rhino uh, pack that has sort of a balloon in it. But you also may want to have some dissolvable types of packing, and those are important, especially in the patient that's on uh, a blood thinner, and, and you're going to try to do this without having them stop their blood thinner, because those you don't have to worry about them re-bleeding when you take out the pack. So, I can just do it by hand. So these are just some uh, examples of different uh, things. You know, tranexamic acid is an antifibrinolytic, and, and there's been studies that show, let's see if, uh, that uh, um, it may be effective. So they, you know, the Cochrane Review, many of you have heard of Cochrane Reviews. They sort of look at the literature, and, and they, after their thorough review of the literature, they said there is a moderate quality evidence that there is a probably a reduction in the risk of rebleeding with the use of either oral or topical tranexamic acid in addition to the usual treatments you use, whether it be packing or, or cautery or whatever. So that's, a, it's, that's a, an adjunct. And as far as given intravenously, we usually recommend a gram IV uh, or the topical can be given like 200 milligrams uh, on a dry, like, roll of cotton and, uh, and, 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 and left in there for like 10 minutes, and then you can reapply it if you need to. But those are some things you can do. So, so we talked about, you know, pressure. And, and then there's cautery. And, uh, you know, I, I would think if you looked at the, the consensus statement by our academy, probably people f pr uh, recommend bipolar if you have it. Some people don't have it in their office. And, uh, and if you have a, let's see if I have it, but there are some bipolar cauteries, I'm not sure what I did with mine, but that basically look like this, but it's an insulated 
tip so it doesn't have things that uh, collect on it, but and it's just a cord and you it cauterize and, and the rest is sort of insulated so it doesn't burn the, the nose, uh, the, the alar rims in the nose. And then the other is a silver nitrate, which I use most of the time in my office. And, uh, and I think if done appropriately, most of the time, unless it's a large bleeder, most of those anterior nosebleeds, I think, can be controlled with uh, silver nitrate. Now, I don't recommend, so if someone comes in and I don't see uh, a, a source and it doesn't bleed when I rub it, I don't just cauterize just thinking that'll do it. I, I got to see a bleeder. And so I'm going to uh, uh, show you a video here. This is, uh, is it command tab? Okay. So this is from the Mayo Clinic here. And... They're going to be doing, it's just two minutes long, a little cautery using silver nitrate. And this is I'm Dr. Erin O'Brien, the division chair for rhinology at Mayo Clinic Rochester. I'm going to go through a simple technique for managing epistaxis with silver nitrate. Uh -oh. This patient has had recurrent epistaxis on the right side. Not, not and though not actively bleeding, we saw this spot on the right anterior septum, which was likely the culprit of her anterior epistaxis. I'm anesthetizing the area with topical lidocaine with phenylephrine on a cotton ball, and we can see this area with a prominent uh, vessel or some granulation tissue. And after we anesthetize it, then I'm going to apply silver nitrate. I leave the cotton ball just behind this area. The silver nitrate can be messy. I'm just going to apply it on the area where it likely has been bleeding, and indeed, once I touch it, it does start bleeding. After using the silver nitrate, my next tip is going to be to use a cotton tip applicator or Q-tip right over that area. It holds that silver nitrate on that area to allow it to cauterize. You may still notice that it is friable or it may bleed again. I'll often do a second application and here we do another uh, silver nitrate stick to apply some fresh silver nitrate, still a little bit oozy. And again, the more important thing is that second Q-tip on this area. It holds that silver nitrate on while it's working. And I've got that area bleeding one more time, another application. Again, it's just localized. You can get a uh, burn through the septum if you're too liberal with your silver nitrate. So just to the area that you need to treat. A cotton-tipped applicator again. Also wipe away the excessive silver nitrate, and then I remove that cotton ball. Now, if it started bleeding excessively, I could put that cotton ball back on easily. So important points, use silver nitrate only on the spot that's bleeding, and after applying silver nitrate, I hold it in place with a dry Q-tip. You can apply it multiple times, but try to focus it and make sure it's well anesthetized. In this video, we used a zero-degree endoscope, but you can... So a couple of things I, I would just say is uh, I do it very similar, but I anesthetize with a Q-tip instead. She put like a cotton strip in there, and I sort of also, you'll see most of the time if you find the vessel, it's like either a dilated vessel like I showed you at the first or a little papule, a red papule, and just touching it gently with the numbing medicine numbs it, but it also it starts to bleed pretty quickly, pretty easily without a lot. And then, and then you just cauterize, you hold pressure, and then the idea is the second Q-tip, I don't know, but it just sort of holds the the silver nitrate against the lesion a little longer, but it also soaks up a little extra silver nitrate. Um, um, so anyway, so, and then the other thing at the end, I will put a little saline gel because that sort of inactivates further silver nitrate so it doesn't go down the throat and you're swallowing this uh, cautery thing in the throat, so a little saline gel. So, so there are some difficult situations that we talked about that uh, may be difficult, and so we're gonna uh, address those here in a second. Um, so we talked about the silver nitrate. Um, so there's packing anterior versus posterior packing. You know, the anterior pack may be about five centimeters. The po anterior posterior is like seven and a half centimeters. Um, if you can't get the bleeding stop, there's, you, you, I would try either a rapid rhino or the, another trick is, is you can put a Foley catheter, like a 12 French Foley catheter in the back of the throat, inflate it with 10 mLs of saline, and then pull it to the front you can even cut off a little, you know, right above the, the hub where the syringe goes on, you can just cut a little strip of that, and so it acts like a little, uh, like a tie, a tie slide that you'd use for uh, scouts, and you just fold the, the excess catheter and you slide that on there and it cinches it up against the nose as you pull it. 
So, and, and I can explain it, but anyway, so now you've, you've kept the blood from going down the back of the throat, especially as it's important in a patient that's, that's difficult to pack because they have a crooked septum. Then you can use that Vaseline strip gauze and just pack it in there. And this shows a picture of how to do that here. I'll show you here in a second. So this is how you layer that packing in. And, uh, and so uh, this is a way you can do it. Just put in, a, put in a, about as much packing as the length of the, of the bayonet forcep, lay it in there, and, and then get another layer in on top, so just on top of it. And that will compress. And I know I'm we're going to sort of speed up here. These are different kinds of packs you can see. These you put in and then moisten with saline. I usually lubricate them with antibiotic ointment first. This is another kind that can be inserted in this way. Uh, and this is a kind that has a balloon in the center that you can add some air. Some have an, uh, you know, some are shorter and some are longer. The longer ones obviously can get anterior and posterior. This is a, it's called an epistat. I, I haven't seen any of these in the ER lately. And then again, this is the gauze with the balloon that I talked to you about, the Foley catheter, and, and then the, and layering the gauze anteriorly. So if you had a really crooked septum and the stiff old uh, Maricel sponge wouldn't go in there, that's an option. And then, and then surgery is a possibility. And uh, again, you may want to do an anterior rhinoscopy to evaluate the posterior nasal cavity. Uh, you get a CT scan to make sure there's not a tumor back there. Uh, may need biopsies, uh, may need a septoplasty. And then there, you may need clipping of what we call the sphenopalatine artery. And this is a, a little bit of a picture, it's hard to see, but it's basically, we do it like a sinus surgery. We're going just a little bit further back than where we do the window for the maxillary sinus. We lift up the mucosa. There's a vessel that's coming out that's tent, tense there. It's, it's about equal with the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. We just put a clip there. And it, it really works pretty well. So, and that just sort of gives you the area at the back where that vessel is coming out there, just in front of the sphenoid sinus. And so, uh, and then the other is, is sometimes we, depending on the patient and what, what problems they have, maybe they can't tolerate surgery, is interventional radiology where, where um, you know, they put a catheter in and they, and they basically um, put a little sponge or coil in the distal branches of the IMF, the internal maxillary artery, and, and, the, um, and sometimes the facial artery. Sometimes they do both sides. And the amazing thing is blood flow is reestablished within two to eight days. And I do usually put in a little packing, but I usually just keep it in a day for that, and then I, and then I pull it out. A lot of people will say, well, how long do you keep packing in if I, once I pack someone? I personally, we were always taught three days, but I know the literature talks about one to, you know, 24 to 72 hours. Um, and obviously, if, if it's prolonged amount, I would definitely have them on antibiotics too, just so you don't get an infection, a sinus infection or a staph infection. So here's the embolization. Are there any questions at all? Yeah, Frank. Yeah. Yes. No, that's that's a great question. So that's right where the foramen is, right down by that maxillary crest coming up right here, that bony part where they come together, and that posterior inferior septal angle. And that's frequently, and sometimes you almost like feel the if you're using silver nitrate, dipping into a little bit of a hole there. Um, but that's where that vessel's coming out, and sometimes you have to hold. But as far as anesthetizing, I always just use topical, and, but I'll spend a lot of time topical. Sometimes I'll use spray first, and then and then topical with a sponge, and I'll leave it in there a little bit of time. But you know, you could always inject if you had to. But but uh, I just think that you know sometimes you, well, you once you numb it with the topical, usually they don't feel the injection that much. So you could do a little uh, top, you know, injectable lidocaine. I think there was another question. So is it just viscous lidocaine? Yeah, you could use two percent viscous lidocaine. I we have in our thing a little topical four percent lidocaine, and it's just more it's liquidy, and so we can spray it in if we want to, or we can soak the pledgets a little bit so they're wet, and we put in the cotton with that. So it's topical. 4% lidocaine, so, yeah. So, um, in my world in, in clinic, I, uh, I don't see a lot of active nosebleeds. Right. Some people who come in that say they previously had nosebleeds, and yeah. a lot will say, you know, they just want their nose cauterized. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't quite know what to do with that. I, I, I never do that. Yeah.
how often do you cauterize their yeah. nose? Um, are you just looking for yeah. a abnormal blood vessel? Or yeah. Is that what you so that's a great question. So what I do is I try to establish a, a site. So this is probably one of the more important questions is you never want to cauterize both sides because you'll get a septal perforation. So never do both sides. So you cauterize one side, you come back six weeks later and do the other side. And if they get a bleed on the other side, you can pack it. But, but so you say, well, is there one side that's more than another? If they're older and they're saying, well, it's both sides and it's heavy, I, I start thinking, you know, maybe, maybe they, they need... Some maybe I need to do a CT scan to look back there. Is it coming posteriorly? But but so once I get a side, if they say, oh, the, the, it's both sides, but the right side's definitely more often, I will take a Q-tip and I dip it in the uh, topical, you know, some Afrin and four percent lidocaine, and I will just gently rub uh, the side of the septum. And 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 usually, if there's a fragile vessel, it'll start to bleed. So you know, most of the time, you can see a little vessel there, and you're not sure if it is. But if you rub it, just sort of rub it a little bit, and you do that for a little bit. Number one, you're numb it. Number two, it starts to bleed. Now, if nothing happens, but I would say, I would say most of the time, if a pe person comes in with a blood, with a history of bleeding, and they can tell me a side, I almost always can find a bleeder. If it's a, if it's a, 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 a trustable uh, history, uh, then almost always I can find the bleeder just by doing what I said, and then cauterize, and they, and they, uh, and they're happy with it. But sometimes they'll come back and say, well, now the left side's bleeding. And, and so I'll wait four weeks. You know, if they have to, they can pack it and before then, but uh, then I'll, and I'll do the other side. So, so that one picture you had up there a, way, a while back showed kind of two vessels that were sort of long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you see that, are you cauterizing yeah. the entire length of that big vessel, blood vessel and then going after the second two? I mean, how yeah. Do you so that's a great question. On that one, I probably would get both vessels. But, but usually one side... At one site, it'll start pumping out, maybe at the convergence or maybe up the limb, and I'll cauterize around that. And it sort of depends, but sometimes you're literally chasing your tail. You cauterize one area, and that stops, but right at the margin of where you stop cauterizing, a little bit bleeds a little bit more. But at the same time, I'm not really saying you just ought to cauterize the whole side, because I think too much silver nitrate may be not the best. But I would, I would if, you know, sometimes you end up doing that a little bit. And the other thing I would say is sometimes you'll see a little silver stain around their nostril as some of that silver nitrate leaks out. And so, I w you know, it's, just, it's like a pen mark on their skin. I just tell them, it's, don't worry, it's going to go away. Uh, but at the same time, that's where that, they use the dry Q-tip after sort of soaks up some of that stuff. And then the saline maybe keeps it from going down the back of their throat a little bit. Yes. Yeah. I mean, is it bad to cauterize the whole, like basically just kind of do a like whole build? I mean, once we get the blood pressure down a little bit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's hard. I would try to find a definite bleeder if you can. If it's maybe everything's oozing, it may be better, to be honest with you, especially if they're on blood thinners, to put a pack in and, and let that, just because I think uh, otherwise you expose cartilage, a lot of cartilage, and while the cartilage potentially if you get blood supply from the other side, it's going to take a, a long time to heal as that skin recovers the cartilage. And, and so as it's healing, you know, potentially it's a crust there and the patients are picking at that crust and then it rebleeds. It's sort of a tough thing, so... Yeah. Yeah. Let me show you what I do. I do. So um, I really, when I first came out of practice, I I would pack it a little firmer. But when I have silver nitrate, if I felt confident and I've done the the dry sponge after, I don't see that it rebleeds. I try to lightly pack it because I feel like the silver nitrate did the trick. Uh, but I want to keep their I, want, I don't want them to traumatize it. And so we just, the, there's these little sponges you can get, sort of like a gel foam. And uh, you can get these little sponges. And, and I, I get some of those and I dip in a little ointment, uh, maybe just a little saline, because that sort of inactivates the silver nitrate. And, and I just sort of cover it a little bit. And I realize they may sneeze and it may fall off, but it's a little coating for a little bit to protect it. And, and so I, but if, if I'm really worried that these are heavy gushing uh, bleeds and I may put a pack in for a few days and again there's different packs some are dissolvable um, 
you know, this is sort of the material of the dissolvable stuff, or this. Some, some of them have antibi, they're a sort of anti, um, they're like an antibiotic type thing. Um, um, and others are permanent, they have to come out. You know, these are more permanent, they have to come out. So if I'm thinking uh, that uh, I'm, I'm worried about taking them out and re-bleeding, then I put in a dissolvable one. Yeah, I think you can use whatever you want, and I don't know if there is. Some people say just Vaseline is fine or saline gel, I'll be honest with you. So I don't, I, I sometimes do an antibiotic, especially if there's lots of crusting in there just to, to help, but, and, and you could use whatever. I use mupirocin, but you could use, um, you know, polysporin or bacitracin or whatever brand you want. That's really useful. Yeah, I just, I don't have any expense, uh, experience with that, but I, I'm sure that's possible. And that's probably, you know, the idea uh, between, uh, you know, some of these sprays that have a little bit of some oils in them just to, to lubricate a little bit. So definitely, I think that's, I just don't have experience. Does anyone else have experience with using that may, that may be a good one, I don't, I don't know. So one thing, another just tip I would say is, uh, I would say when you put in your pack, you know, remember, you're not, even though we think, oh, you follow the bridge in those, it's really almost, it's almost a down. Can you see that angle? It's more of a down, and that's, that's you're following the inferior turbine. Now, it may be that on top of that, you have to put a shorter pack, because remember, the skull base goes this direction. And so, so up higher, you're going to have to have something shorter. And so, um, so, so sometimes I'll take these packs, I'll put a longer one, I'll get a second one, I'll cut it up into smaller pieces and tuck it up higher. And so that, that, you, that may help you a little bit too. So. Yes? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, you know, there's, there's a ton of different products, and, and again, I have no financial interest in any of them, but some of them, you know, I think some of the major companies like Medtronic, uh, there's a company called Posicep or Medpor. I mean, I'm just, I'm think, I'm, I mean, I don't know, but I would check the costs, you know, whatever seems like it's economically, because I think they're all s similar. Some of the products, like, have uh, chitis in, in, which is almost like made out of, I guess, uh, um, you know, crustacean stuff. But, uh, uh, but anyway, so chitosin is supposed to help with infection and, and it's dissolvable and uh, has some um, uh, hemostatic properties to it. So some of them have that in. Um, and so, and this, is, this, is, this brand is just called Hemopore. I'm not even sure who, it's Stryker. And, and, and it supposedly it's, it's colored a little bit, but it's supposed to help with, I don't know if that color helps with the bleeding, but also maybe a little bit of antibacterial too. So anyway, so. You know, and, and some are pace. I don't really use the pace for, because I think you need pressure, but some are like a, you know, you can go back and forth between two syringes. Uh, but uh, anyway, so. Yeah, so, so that's another thing you may find, the ones you like. Some of them take longer to dissolve, and they're really granular and messy, and takes a lot of time to get them out of there. Others dissolve pretty quickly, just turn into a dissolvable mush, you know, almost like a, you know, some thick mucus, really. So that may be influence which kind you buy. And that's sort of a trial and error thing. You may just decide ones you like better than others. For the trans acid, uh, are there any contraindications that you know of? And then, in general, like you mentioned Yeah, so that article I referred to earlier, and, and, and uh, um, they say it's fairly safe. It's safe, and uh, um, and I would have to be honest with you. I'd have to look, and and I'm sure everything has its potential side effects. And for tranexamic, such as an anti-fibrinolytic, it may be maybe increase clots elsewhere, I guess. But uh, 